Hey, this is Andy. You know, chances are someone in your organization is putting together training plans for next year. You know, we have a series of workshops that helps organizations improve their ability to deliver projects and lead teams. And our team of facilitators deliver those classes around the world. I would love to have the opportunity to work with you. So check the show notes for information on how we can partner with you to help your organization deliver. Thanks. Welcome to the People and Projects Podcast, where you'll find interviews and insights to help you deliver projects and lead teams. You can find us on the web at peopleandprojectspodcast.com. Searching. Hi, this is Andy Kaufman, President of the Institute for Leadership Excellent Development Corporate. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the People and Projects Podcast. So, so does this happen to you? I mean, I'm looking around my home or office for something. I, I just can't find it. And yet someone else, uh, let's say it's my wife. She walks up and says, Ah, oh, here it is. <laughs> How does she do that? I mean, how is it that people see things that, in retrospect, are obvious, but in the moment, we're blind to it? Searching Oh, searching You know, this isn't just an issue of trying to find something that's lost. I mean, when making decisions, we can be blind to better options. When planning a project, we can be blind to risks that are just lurking out there. When listening to a problem from a team member, we can be blind to the fact that there's actually a problem. It's easy for us to succumb to what is sometimes called the illusion of knowledge. If if I'm ignorant, then that motivates me to ask questions and to be curious. And that Mm -hmm. sets me on, on a good path. If I have the illusion of knowledge... Then uh, what I what I do is is I fixate. I I, I think I'm I'm not curious. I already know, so I don't have to investigate. I don't have to be curious, and uh, and and I, I just stop my own inquiry right there. So it, that illusion of knowledge is is, is what gets in, really gets in the way. That's my guest today. Hi, I'm Gary Klein. Gary is a cognitive psychologist. I do research on how people make decisions under extreme time pressure and uncertainty. Could it be that as we become more expert at running projects, that we get too overconfident? True experts are almost always doubting themselves. And that's one of the ways that we distinguish them. When we ask people, tell us about your last mistake. People who pretend to be experts, usually they respond, ah, oh, I can't think of anything. And they, they, mm. really, they, they, they rack their brains, and it's not part of what, what they're aware of. The true experts, you ask them, tell us about your last mistake, they, they answer immediately because that mistake has been burning at them. That, you know, yeah. that, that's been frustrating them, and they've been asking themselves, what could I have done, what should I have done? Gary has written a wonderful book that broadens our perspective on what it takes to gain insights, to see things differently, to stay open-minded about risks and other approaches that can help us more wisely lead and deliver. I look forward to sharing that interview with Gary in just a bit. Hey, and I want to let you know, make a note to join me and other listeners for our monthly podcast webinar. It'll be on Monday, August 25th, 2014 at 11 a.m. Central Daylight Savings Time in the U.S., which is GMT minus five. We'll go into more detail on ideas from this interview with Gary, so please join us. Check out the show notes for details on how to register for the free webinar. Thanks. Today we're talking with Gary about his most recent book, Seeing What Others Don't, The Remarkable Ways We Gain Insights. Gary, thank you for joining us on the People and Projects Podcast. And thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Our pleasure. You know, Gary, you've been an influential voice on intuition and insight. So at some level, they kind of sound similar. So how would you differentiate intuition from insight? Right. So um, intuition is how we use patterns that we've built up over uh, past experience. And we just, we, we, we're not aware of it, but we build up these patterns and we can use them to, to make sense of situations and know what to do without having to think it through. 
That's mm-hmm. intuition, using the patterns we've learned. Insight is how we get new patterns. Yeah, that okay, that makes sense. You know, um, I, I just have to say, after reading your book, I, it, it's clear to me you're not just a typical laboratory researcher. And, and what I mean is, every once in a while, you know, I'll see someone, you know, give a link to uh, some laboratory-based study, and it just makes you wonder about the methodology. Like, something just recently in the last month I read where uh, that people don't like to be alone. They'd rather be doing something. And then the, the study said possibly even hurting themselves. And, and, I mean, I get that we like to be engaged, but what – what um, what, as I understand it, the subjects in the lab, they were offered the option of administering a mild electric shock to themselves by pressing a button. Now, I guess it turns out that you and I, guys shock each other more than ladies, but my, my, my point is in the real world, we don't usually have those buttons sitting around the house or the office. And so it just made me wonder about these lab things. So how does your approach vary from a typical laboratory study? Here? So the typical laboratory study um, works at a different part of the scientific method than we do. So a typical laboratory study tries to take uh, hypotheses. You, ha- you have these mm-hmm. theories about how things work, and you come up with implications. Those are your hypotheses. And then in the lab, you test those hypotheses. You want to have controlled conditions, and you want to have everything nicely laid out and, and, and carefully mm-hmm. scoped out. And that's the way you do laboratory research. That's not the way we do research. We uh, About uh, a, a quarter of a century ago, in the late 1980s, uh, 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 I helped to found the field of naturalistic decision making. And, and the, the, the uh, uh, approach there is to try to look at the real, at, at, at uh, natural settings. These are complex mm-hmm. settings, uh, lots of ambiguity, vague goals, um, people who have lots of expertise in the tasks that they're doing. And we want to see how do people actually make decisions? How do they actually make sense of, of complicated situations? How do they actually plan and, and replan? And so yeah. we, th- this, is, this is a different part of the, of the scientific method. We're trying to formulate theories and, and they're trying to, to test theories. And their complaints about us are that we're not rigorous enough. And yeah. our complaints about them uh, are that um, they're not relevant enough. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I got to tell you, the more I read your approach, the more I'm like, ah, that makes so much sense <laughs> because you're seeing it and, and you're, you know, I would have to think there's so much potential for bias in any approach. But when you're at least trying to observe, it feels like it's at least one way to try to mitigate some of that bias. I don't know. Right. It's a way to mitigate the bias. It's a way to try to find out what, what's, what's really happening in, the, in these situations rather than rushing to, to test hypotheses, even ones that, that are trivial, like, like the one you described about people shocking themselves. <laughs> and and, and a, a dirty secret is a lot of those laboratory studies don't ever replicate. I mean, you know, mm. people do a, a variety of things, and if they get one of them to be significant, they can publish it. But then <laughs> if you try to replicate, the, you know, uh, 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 come up with the same findings in another study, it doesn't happen. Whereas the work that I did with, with decision-making and firefighters, um, a number of people tried immediately to replicate it, and they all succeeded. Mm. You know, I, sh- I showed your chart to my kids of the when Wagner Dodge was trying to escape the uh, forest fire. <laughs> in his altitude and when people listening to us they're gonna have to get the book to see it but our kids there's something about that that just wow that was really tough and i'm gonna ask the next question but i first have to shock myself okay good all right no i'm good all right yeah okay okay so uh, so years ago i was deeply influenced gary by a quote from uh historian daniel borston i i don't really know anything about him but this one quote will really move me he observed the greatest obstacle to knowledge is not ignorance it's the illusion of knowledge. And you, you refer to that in the book. How does this illusion of knowledge obstruct our ability to develop insights? If, if I'm ignorant, then that motivates me to ask questions and to be curious. And that mm-hmm. sets me on, on a good path. If I have the illusion of knowledge... Then uh, what I what I do is is I fixate. I I, I think I'm I'm not curious. I already know, so I don't have to investigate. I don't have to be curious, and uh, and and I, I just stop my own inquiry right there. So it, that illusion of knowledge is is, is what gets in, it really gets in the way. 
Is that related to what sometimes people call the curse of expertise? I mean, not completely, but part of it, like I have this expertise and so I, I just assume I know what it is but I'm not going to be open-minded. Does that, does that have some parallel? I'm sure that, that it does. I happen to think that, that, that true experts are almost always doubting themselves. And that's one mm. of the ways that, that we distinguish them. When we ask people, tell us about your last mistake. People mm. who pretend to be experts, usually they respond, oh, I can't think of anything. And, and they, they, mm. really, they, they, they rack their brains and it's not part of what, what they're aware of. The true experts, you ask them, tell us about your last mistake, they, they answer immediately because that mistake has been burning at them. That, you know, yeah. that, that's been frustrating them and they've been asking themselves, what could I have done? What should I have done? I love that. And, and actually, this is somewhat related because you mentioned in your book that an open mind has its virtues, but a suspicious mind provides its own benefits. And I, I, Gary, I'm amazed at how much work it can be for me to get beyond what I believe you call a passive stance. You know, I, I have to force myself at times to be a healthy skeptic. And yet, here's an observation. I mean, you say that about experts, but I wonder sometimes, do the suspicious minds, are, are, are they often not seemingly rewarded, whether it's a scientist or a professional in the workplace, it seems that sometimes the skeptic with a contrarian view can be seen as they're not being a team player or they're slowing us down because they're wasting everyone's time, you know, and maybe it'd come down to a better understanding of what you mean by a suspicious mind. And, and I'm interested, what do you do personally, Gary, to maintain a suspicious mind? Right. I don't think, I don't think we do, um, I don't think there's anything we do personally. I think it's sort of who we are and the experiences we've had and what's paid off for us in the past. And I, I think you're exactly right. In most settings, voicing a contrarian uh, uh, idea um, mm -hmm. breaks the harmony of the group and people aren't happy with it. And I've seen in, in research settings where what you want is new and different ideas and somebody, but people who voice them are looked on like, well, that's not the way we do things here. And, and so they're, they're, they're marginalized. And so a mm. contr contrarian view is one that some people take more naturally than others. They, they just, when they hear something, they say, how could it not be true? What could be wrong with it? They, they just mm. immediately are examining it for flaws or, or limitations. And, and, and so they're, they're quick to spot contradictions. And that's, that's really valuable. As, but then they, they have the burden do I speak up or not? And, uh, mm, and, and some organizations yeah. want people to speak up, but, they're, but, but they know that people are afraid to because they've gotten punished in the past. And so they say, let's, uh, let's uh, appoint somebody a devil's advocate. But that doesn't work because that means I don't have, I don't have to be a contrarian anymore. That's what I've outsourced it to the devil's advocate. But when the <laughs> devil's advocate says something, we say, well, he doesn't, he or she really doesn't believe it. They're, they're, they're just <laughs> their job, so we can right. we can ignore it anyway. Now, I'm gonna, right. I'll tell you, I, I, I'm more gullible than I want to be. You know, when I hear mm. something that's exciting, I just um, uh, I resonate to it the, the way you're describing. So, so something happens, and uh, you say, wait a second, I wasn't expecting that. There's there's something strange about that. Let me yeah. instead of just um, shrugging it off. Let me think about it more clearly. Do you want? Okay, I can give you an example if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, that'd be perfect. All right. So um, a number of years ago, uh, the company that I founded, we, we we built our own building, and we had mm. to have a security system. So we um, we had a contractor put in a security system, great security system, and the contractor now was going to give us a tour and show us how to use it, and and, and it was all going to work out. And the contractor was very proud and said, "Here's the system." We all gathered around. And, and, and he said, uh, um, so this system will automatically arm itself at some hour late at night. And so it's going to automatically protect uh, the building. Any, any movement or anything is going to be detected and uh, immediately contact uh, 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 the office. So that's mm -hmm. going to happen. And we're going to give you an additional capability. You can enter in the code. If you're leaving and nobody else is here, you're leaving. You just enter in this code. And he showed us how. And now the system is automatically armed and it's going to count down from like about 40 seconds so you have enough time to get out of the building and then you shut the yeah. door and then it's armed and everybody said yeah. great that's wonderful and I looked at it and I said so if I'm really angry at somebody in the building and I'm feeling very childish <laughs> and the two of us you see where I'm going two of us right. late at night and I know that there's nobody else What's to stop me from sneaking out, punching mm. in the code, 
quietly closing the door and now this poor this poor fool <laughs> as soon as he or she walks out of uh, the office they're going to set off the alarm and they and they're going to be stuck and yeah. and somebody else in somebody in the group said Gary you're the only one here who would think of such a thing <laughs> <laughs> and I, that wasn't meant as a compliment. It was like, you know, we're all good citizens. You know, why we? But but I, I just sort of naturally thought about how would the system not work? What could get? Yeah. What could go wrong? Right. I love that. I love that. You know, uh, last night over dinner we had an interesting discussion, and uh, a friend had called uh, my wife and posed somewhat of an ethical issue that a family thing that they're going to go through and. And trying to looking for advice of what they should do, which I, I thought I really respected them for. And there seemed to be a relatively obvious decision. But what we decided to do as a family was let's take the other position. Let, let's say that she does the opposite thing, which is less likely. How could we justify it? And it was weird taking the other side of it and trying to force ourselves. And that came to mind as I, as I was thinking about this suspicious mind. It can, you know, because someone could say, well, Gary, nobody's going to do that with the keypad. But somebody could do it or somebody could accidentally do it. Or, you know, if, if we can force ourselves to take this other position, I think that might be a practical way to try to have a suspicious mind. Huh? I think that I think that might work. And um, speaking about family dinners, when my two daughters were, were growing up, we would get into all kinds of arguments around yeah. uh, discussions about you know different ideas uh, as we would have dinner. And, I, yeah. and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say they, they, they would often uh, be uh, out debating me <laughs> in, <laughs> in some of these discussions. And so uh, maybe just in self-defense, I, I instituted a procedure where if it was going too, they would usually gang up on me. If it was going too badly for me, I would say, switch. And as ah. soon as I said switch, they had to argue the opposite viewpoint. Oh, I love that. That is a great idea. I think we have a new tradition in the Kaufman family, especially <laughs> especially when I'm losing the argument. Especially when you're losing the argument. <laughs> and they could do it. I don't know why they agreed to do it, but they agreed to do it. And they yeah. could do it. And then they would occasionally call switch on me, but they could do a better job than I could of changing yeah. perspective. But then my younger daughter said, you know, I, I discovered something odd. Um, whichever argument I'm making last is the one I wind up believing. <laughs> mm, well, that's, there's probably something to that, yeah. interestingly enough. Yeah, yeah. You know, the people listening to us right now are responsible for delivering projects and leading teams, so typically in a leadership role. What are some examples of things that leaders might do in organizations that can actually be hindering insights that the people on their team might be trying to have? Yeah, this was one of the discouraging parts of the research that I did uh, uh, in, in preparing this book was mm. how, how organizations think that they want insights and new ideas, <laughs> but they really don't. They, they really block mm. the new ideas because organizations like things to run smoothly. They like yeah. not, not to have any mistakes, and mm. they like to have a smooth schedule, and they like things to, to just run, run in, 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 in an easy way that makes it easy for them to, to manage. And insights are disorganizing. They're yeah. disruptive. Yeah. And so yeah. people who voice them, now it shakes everything up, and it makes everybody's job harder, and there's a natural... Um, concern about new ideas. Have we thought it through? Could something go wrong? And so organizations, yeah. even when they claim um, we're, we're here to, uh, to encourage insights, if you watch their actions, they're, they're afraid of new ideas and they try to block them. An example I can think of is if someone brings a risk to me, I can't tell you how much blood I have on my hands here, or I might say, hey, thanks for bringing that to me. Oh, we'll, we'll take that risk on. But what I was really was saying was, nah, 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 right? I'm, not, I'm not listening to it. Or the way we react to something, maybe we get a little harsh with somebody, not really harsh, but just harsh enough that they're like, you know what? He doesn't want to hear the truth. Right. And, and, it, and it shuts it down. Just subtle little things that we might be doing. You know? Right. Yeah. And I read someplace that uh, for many people, one of the most stressful times of the day is the time that they spend with their boss. I, I was actually in the yeah. New York Times uh, the, the, uh, yesterday in, in, in the Times Review session section mm. about how you know bosses are there uh, to make sure that people don't commit mistakes rather than to celebrate successes and uh, and encourage 
encourage exploration. You know, I imagine it's easier to see in other people and not in ourselves. So I'm glad we I'm glad we hit that because uh, we I, I bet I bet I do it with my kids. I bet I do it with my wife. I bet I do it with people that I lead more than what I realize. So thanks for that reminder. It's a it's a it's a tendency that that I think all of us have. And um, uh, do you want a, a, another short? Ad- Please. So um, absolutely. One of the things that I do is is I write articles and they have to get reviewed and then people ask me to, to review articles uh, for journals and uh, and I know, and I see what other people other reviewers have done and what mm-hmm. reviewers tend to do when they get an article and somebody has spent years you know uh, <laughs> doing this research and they have something that they're excited about and what do, what do reviewers do we look at the methods section to see is there are there any flaws and we look at the uh-huh. results section are there any mistakes they made or or things they should have done differently it's not what did, what did they find that, that could be in, exciting and, and important? And I got mm. to a point uh, a number of years ago where I said, I'm not going to write any review unless I can sign my name to it because mm. then that's going to at least a, a little bit keep me from being so negative and, 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 right. and, and, so, um, and, and, and being just too critical. I mean, I like that. Not that yeah. I, shouldn't be, I shouldn't criticize things, but I, I should have a more balanced review. Mm-hmm. Love it. You know, I asked an inventor once, um, hey, how do you come up with ideas? And, I, and I'd never heard this sort of response. He goes, I try to misuse things. I'm like, what do you mean by that? He goes, I try to use existing things in ways they weren't intended, which is interesting. So how, how would his approach fit into the model that you propose for insights? Okay, so I think that, you know, that actually describes the example with the alarm system that I described yeah. Which was a way not not to increase uh, the security of the company, but to but to to use it to punish people that I happen to be, to be you know feeling petulant about. Uh, and mm. by the way, I never did that. But uh, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get on your bad side now. <laughs> and and there, there were once because I like to work late at night. There would be occasional times when I I would alarm the system, walk out, and see there was a second car in the parking lot, and I go running right. back <laughs> to, to try to uh, and. and I I always succeeded at undoing it, but uh, yeah, so I, yeah. I, I just thought about it. But I, I, I just because I wanted to see how could I misuse the system. The path I talk in my book, I talk about three paths to insight. One is yeah. about making connections. One is about seeing contradictions, and one is about creative desperation, which mm-hmm. is um, trying to actively uh, explore. Uh, limits to the way we think about things. And so the creative desperation path, I think it fits that creative desperation path about misusing things because it's conscious and deliberate, unlike the other Mm. two. And so Mm -hmm. this is a way of trying what what his strategy is of of misusing things. It's a way of exposing assumptions that he might not have, people might not have been aware of. But it also does a second thing, which is it lets him spot leverage points that others might not have considered. Yeah. I was thinking maybe uh, potentially the contradiction path in that he was trying to maybe find an inconsistency or rebuild a new story with the existing thing. And so I, I, I wasn't sure, but and I guess it's less important to try to uh, build it back of which technique. It's The technique is there to try to help us come up with insights. But, exactly. Um, yes. Yeah. I feel like sometimes my best ideas, Gary, come when I'm out on a road bike. And I, I think you might have had a reference in the book that you might. Are you a cyclist as well? Yes, I do. I, I, I like to ride a bike. Yeah. So uh, if asked before reading your book, I think I might have said that these ideas I get was because I, I was disengaged or maybe in Wallace's term, the incubation, you know, allowing the ideas to churn and form connections in my subconscious until they kind of like erupt out there. Uh, but. After reading your book, I'm not completely satisfied with that description. So how might your model describe how these ideas pop up when we're not necessarily trying to come up with ideas? Right. So um, one idea I thought is, is that this is what incubation uh, is, is all about. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, it may be that we, when we're struggling so much to come up with new ideas, we're just creating some cognitive fatigue. And so oh, by yeah. going for a bike ride, um, you, uh, you let that fatigue dissipate. And, yeah. uh, and, and so that's a possibility. Another is by going for a bike ride, um, 
you know, we're, we're usually thinking about a bunch of things. We're, we're, we're thinking randomly, and there's a lot of free associations. And so, so uh, all you need is for one, uh, a couple of them to make connection. And it's not something that you deliberately were looking for, that connection. But by having sort of a random free association state, you, you mm-hmm. allow the ideas to come together. And a third possibility is, um, you know, you may have had a recent experience and you haven't quite sorted it out yet. And then you say, wait a second, this relates to something else. Now, all of a sudden, you've closed a loop. You have a form of connection that yeah. uh, just because there's a, a new event that, uh, that, that, that you've had and, you, and, and you're in the process of, of assimilating it and absorbing it uh, into, into your other ideas. Yeah. I, I think this, I don't know, this incubation thing seems uh, just anecdotally to be kind of effective. But I, I think what I got from your book was it's like, you, I think you said something along the lines of if you review something before you go out on your bike, you know, you found it more effective. Was it, was, was there something like that? Do I remember? Exactly. In? So yeah, I yeah. try to, if, if, if there's like a, a, a conceptual problem I'm having, then I'll, I'll just, you know, look over my notes and look over the material and I'll say, okay, let it sit. And now I go for the bike ride and I, I don't deliberately think about it anymore. Right, but it, right. I, I just know that someplace in my subconscious, it's working. I, ju- I just, I yeah. have a lot of trust in, in, in that happening. Yeah, 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 okay. So so let's say a project manager, they're listening to us, and, and they've got a person on their team that's driving them crazy. I mean, this person isn't following, let's say, the agreed upon process, and the project manager keeps telling the team member what they're doing wrong, but it seems to fall on deaf ears. So you've got some interesting advice in your book. What advice do you have for the project manager who wants to help a team member who just isn't getting it? A couple of possibilities. Uh, can, I, can I start with an example? Oh, please do, yeah. All right. So years ago, I was we were uh, putting on an on-the-job training program for a, a fire department. And... Yeah. Um, and we were teaching people how to how to build people's uh, experience uh, expertise level build their their competence and and they were you know without teaching classes just just stuff that happens on the job and how to make that work and mm-hmm. one of the one of the guys he was a battalion training officer said does this also work for people with personality problems mm-hmm. and and I'm not a clinical psychologist I don't want to go mm-hmm. there and I said no this isn't for personality problems it's it's just for um you know, it's it, it, it's for for helping people pick up tips and see things and notice things and stuff like that and and, and build uh, technical competence. So yeah. it was like a, a several part workshop. And so he came back a month later and he said, "You're wrong. Let me tell you what happened after our last session. We yeah. we had a fire and we we were, we were all he was part of my crew and I told him what to do and once again he didn't do what I told him." Yeah. And uh, just really annoyed me. I, and 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 I, I I called him to my office when we all go, got back to the station. I called him in because I was going to read him. I was going to ream him out. I was going to tell him I'm going to write you up. And I've been writing each of these up. We're going to I'm going to get you out of the fire department because you really don't belong here. And yeah. I was about to do that, and he was coming into my office, and you had given us a poster about on-the-job training and things we could do. And I said, okay, I'm going to ream them out, but first I'll try one of these other things, and then I'll ream them out. <laughs> so so, I, 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 so he, told, he said, I said to him, okay, so um, when we were out there, I, I gave you this order, and, uh, and here's what you did, and that, that surprised me. Um, can you tell me what you were thinking about? Yeah. And then, then he said, to, to, to the class, because he was now back a month later, he said, you know, he really had a good reason. Mm-hmm. And I had been mm-hmm. thinking about this guy. He's an attitude problem. And in that m- instant, I realized he's not the attitude problem. I'm the attitude problem. Interesting. Because, yeah. you know, I, I haven't explored what his reasons are. And I ha- and maybe if he has bad reasons, then I can help uh, help him build a better mental model. But at least I can show him the respect and 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 and, uh, and and create a dialogue about what what he was trying to do, and so yeah. I think a lot of times people are are frustrating us because they're not doing what we want, and um, the first step is to find out what what's in their head. Why are they approaching it the way they are? Maybe they do have a flawed mental model and and some strange beliefs 
and we can help them correct the beliefs and, and that, that are that, that, that are mistaken. But other times, we can take advantage if they have a different perspective than we do. This is a way, a place that insights emerge from conflicts yeah. and, and 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 from uh, confusions. We can say. Why are people, good people, getting confused? What's what's yeah. going on here? And and we can learn more. Yeah. Now there's another thing you can do with somebody who's persistently a pain in the neck. <laughs> uh, and and I've done this. If if I'm leading a project, I say, here's the way I'm I'm understanding the situation, and here's what I'm trying to do. And there'll be somebody who says, I think you're you're reading it wrong. Mm. Uh, and and I'll say, I may be. But we have to take action here, and we can't. We're not a debating society, and I'm in charge of this project. So my way goes. This is the way we will all understand the project to to be uh, the the situation. Here's what we're going to do. But you, you're skeptical of me. I don't want you to lose that skepticism. I want mm. you, you're going to help us in case I'm wrong. So I want you to gather evidence. And then you come back and, and circle back. If it looks like like it, it makes uh, like I really am wrong, I'm going to depend on you to be my early warning system. Yeah. But that way they they don't disrupt the harmony. But I'm not trying to to brainwash them either. I'm trying to take advantage of them. Oh, that really walks the line well because if you just shut it down, it's what we talked about before, where they will shut down and we could go, all go over a cliff together. Right. And, and yet it has a bias for action as well. Right. Yeah. I like that. You know, identifying and managing risk. This is a big responsibility for those of us, uh, those who are listening to us. And one of the challenges is just even seeing the risks, you know, being aware that they even exist. And it was probably a year ago when I heard about your idea of the pre-mortem for the first time. And I have found such great success with it. And though this was from a previous book, I would love for our listeners to hear from you, not some other author talking about your idea here. So here's the scenario. Well, let's say that some listeners have decided they're going to go for their project management professional PNP certification. Uh, they've begun their study. They're aiming to take this exam in about four months, and it's considered to be a reasonably difficult exam. So if you were to simulate leading a pre-mortem with this group of aspiring PNPs, what would it sound like, Gary? Okay, so um, we'd, we'd, we'd all be in the group. Yeah, and uh, actually, I just did a pre-mortem last week uh, with a, a bunch of uh, army officers at Fort Benning. It was, it was a lot of fun. And, yeah. uh, so, but but for your example, um, I would say, okay, everybody, you know, we we know the plan. We've you know, we're going to take the exam. What do we have? Would you say it's going to be in four four weeks? Four months. Four let's months. Say, okay, yep. we got four mm-hmm. months. All right, I, um, and. Uh, we, we we know what what our plan is so that we we, we can all pass it. Everybody's mm-hmm. clear. You know we we we've got our assignments. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Now I want you all to relax. Just sort of lean back in your chair. Now I'm I'm looking in a crystal ball to see what happens. It's now four months and we're getting the test results back. Oh gosh. Oh this is horrible. I'm sorry to tell you this. According to the crystal ball, most of you have failed. This is a disaster. We have just gone, we've worked like crazy for four months, and we were not able to get a a high success rate. Most of the people in this room have failed. The crystal ball never lies, and we know that you have failed. (laughs) Now, I want you in two minutes, each one of you, to write down all the reasons why that image came up in the crystal ball. Why did you fail? Yeah. Write down all the reasons you can, and then they write down the reasons. And then they stop them after two minutes, because after that it just, you know, it, it doesn't get productive. And yeah. I've got a whiteboard, and I, and I turn to usually the group leader to, to mm-hmm. start and, and, and to set an example, and I say, what's the top of your list? Mm-hmm. And they would say, okay, here's what I think went wrong. And then I put it, yeah. and I'd say, okay, how many people had that? And mm-hmm. I go to the next person. What did you have at the top of your list that's different from the leader? And I get a second. We go around the room usually at least once, sometimes twice, and we have a whole bunch of, 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 of possible reasons that people, uh, in, in, in most settings, people are usually, they don't want to disturb the harmony, so they, they, they don't discuss these kinds of things that might happen. Yes, yes. And now yeah. we're... Um, 
See, it's, it's the same problem we talked about before with being a contrarian. Nobody mm-hmm. wants to go public with their doubts. Yeah. And the pre-mortem is a way of a legitimate of, of requiring that. This is the way yeah. you show you're smart by coming up with reasons nobody that, that are plausible that nobody had thought of. And so there's yeah. a little competition to come up with things that we should be worrying about. <laughs> right. And then people are, are, are trying to come up with, 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 with important things that we need to consider. Now, we found that this gets a little bit discouraging. We, we've just done a study, we did a study a few years ago that showed that this method reduces confidence levels more than any others. It seems to really mm-hmm. reduce overconfidence. But some of the people in my company said, maybe it does too good a job of reducing confidence. <laughs> Self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> right. Can we do anything yeah. about it? So I added another step at the end. I said, mm-hmm. look at the items on this list and everybody think about one thing that you can do that's not part of our current plan. One thing that yeah. you can do to prevent that image in the, uh, in the crystal ball from coming about. Yeah. I like that. that. That's an excellent addition to the step. Yeah. You know, uh, the times I've run this, uh, some of it has been this very scenario. And right when I say you failed, someone in the room goes, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like it grabs them at a uh, emotional level. And I wonder if that's part of the part of the magic behind it is that it forces them to acknowledge this project or this initiative or whatever could fail. Right. Where we... Yeah, people so are gripped by overconfidence, and and yeah. uh, you know Danny Kahneman talks about this is the thing that worries him the most about poor decision making is overconfidence, and mm-hmm. people, entrepreneurs, in all kinds of 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 areas, um, people can't imagine that, that that what they're doing might fail, and so they're they they take they, they take risks that they shouldn't take and they and they yeah. don't they don't hedge those risks appropriately and they don't you know prepare themselves with backup plans or escape routes or things like that yeah you know um Gary, it feels like I can hardly pick up a business book without some reference to your work. And so uh, that that's a testament to the difference you've made. Uh, I mean, you understand the complexities and the mysteries of decision-making insights in ways I'm just beginning to even appreciate, much less perhaps even understand. But here's what I'm wondering. In all that you write and speak about on these topics, what's most difficult for you to do when you're faced with making a decision or trying to come up with an insight? Right. What's what's my biggest flaw as a decision maker? My biggest mm-hmm. weakness, and um, uh, I would have trouble articulating it if it wasn't for my wife, who's very, <laughs> very uh, capable of, of 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 pointing it out. Uh, because yeah. I, I, I uh, it's a, a problem again and again. Is my my tendency to indulge in magical thinking, mm-hmm. where yeah. Uh, yeah, I can make that happen. Oh, we can do mm. that in two weeks, <laughs> and you know, and where a more prudent person would say, "Let's not take that on. Let's let's yeah. just prioritize." I hate to prioritize because that means something that I want to do, I'm not going to get to do, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, I don't have that kind of restraint. And 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 so I say, "No, no, no. We 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 can make it happen," and and usually we do. The trouble is, I get re- rewarded too many times. <laughs> and, and but uh, but uh, in the meantime, I I I, I drive myself and, and others a little bit crazy trying to meet um, objectives that we we should have been more more cautious about. I, I'd say that that's my biggest problem. You've pulled the rabbit out of the hat enough times that you think we can do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I think for my response to this, Gary is. Um, you know, that idea that what you see is all there is, you know, yeah. that, that was very, uh, that was very convicting to me as I read this. In fact, you, you had a, you had a quote in the book that the more central the belief is to our thinking, the harder it is to give up. And I, I just find that when it comes to decision making or trying to come up with the insight, it's so hard for me to force myself to look at data beyond what I'm aware of. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it just seems like I'm not even motivated to do it because it's so obvious. And so I felt like the book was a good challenge to double check uh, my assumptions. They might just be flawed. In fact, they probably are flawed, you know, because of that. So. But, but, but we, 
we, I don't want people to, to, to say, let me list all of my assumptions and see which ones are flawed, because mm. the assumptions that, are, that bite us are usually the ones that we make unconsciously. Right, right. So that's why we have to be sensitive. Not, we, have, we shouldn't be making these lists of all my assumptions, but we should be sensitive to anything that suggests an inconsistency mm. or a contradiction. Mm. And instead yeah. of brushing it away, which is our tendency, oh, that's just a transient uh, data point. I don't have to worry about it. I mean, usually it is, but maybe we should give it a little bit of thought. Maybe it's telling us something. Should just yeah. open our minds and see what the implication could be. Yeah. I, in fact, I feel like your book is little things like, you know, that's funny, or what's going on here, or you know, simple little things like that that I took away that I thought were just clever ways to. Uh, maybe surface some of those flawed assumptions as opposed to trying to bullet point them, right. which we wouldn't even know anyway. Yeah. Right. Well, for those listening, this is just giving you a taste of what you're going to get from Gary Klein's book, Seeing What Others Don't, The Remarkable Ways We Gain Insights. I really encourage you to pick up a copy and also check out his books on decision making and intuition. I've included links in the show notes for this cast. So Gary, thank you so much for joining us on the People and Projects Podcast. Thank you for the opportunity. I enjoyed the conversation. Hey, just a quick reminder that if you're listening to this before Monday, August 25th, 2014, please join me and other listeners for an hour-long follow-up to this episode. Go to peopleandprojectspodcast.com slash 118 to register for the free session. Well, thank you for joining me for today's discussion with Gary Klein. Stay tuned for some outtakes from the episode. Have a great week. I would have to say, I mean, there's so many good lines in your book, but you know, one that just made me laugh out loud was something along the lines of, you had no ambition of being a researcher of stupidity. It's bad enough being a practitioner. <laughs> <laughs> that, just, that just cracked me up. You know, it, it, it was kind of characteristic of your uh, humility in there, too. So I, uh, I appreciate just the, uh, I learned a lot and uh, laughed a lot. So that was good. I'm yeah. glad you enjoyed it. And, and you know, we all do stupid things, so at least I could get a little bit of value from my own right. stupidity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So over the weekend, I opened up Bob Sutton's book, Scaling Up Excellence, and I just randomly opened that page, and guess <laughs> guess what? He's like, Gary Clark, your name is everywhere, man. <laughs> A better understanding of what you mean by a suspicious—I can't even say it—by a suspicious mind. Uh, I resonate to it the, the, the way you're describing, but, yeah. but but something happens. Oops, excuse me. Hmm. Yeah, no problem. Let me um, turn. I, I forgot that this was. I yeah, no problem. Um, um, uh, I just put it on on silent. Uh, do you want me to go over that again? Okay, that's a wrap, man. I I, I apologize. I took more time than I meant to here, Gary. But you're you're such an interesting guy to talk <laughs> with, man. Thank you very much. You know yeah. something? I really enjoy this podcast, <laughs> and I do it yeah. of these. I I really enjoy this conversation, and you, I, I mean, you you are an, an an amazing host for these podcasts because you gave me the script, and yet yeah. in the middle of the podcast. You were just so natural as you would go from one to the other. <laughs> Nobody, oh, if I didn't you. have the script, I would say he's just winging it. This is just sort of casual, easy conversation. Well, you uh, you did a great job responding to the spontaneous question, so thank you for that. I uh, I look forward to uh, continuing to learn from you, Gary. Thank you for the for the great efforts. Any uh, future book projects in the works? I mean, I, I think you didn't even tend to write this one I seem to no. oh, right. yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I thought I was done this one took me by surprise like you know somebody all of a sudden uh, uh, finds out uh, gosh how did I get pregnant so uh, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> how did that happen yeah. I don't have any books immediately but I have a couple of projects that I, I just I find very exciting that, I, that I'm working on so yeah, yeah, uh, I don't know what somewhere. they'll turn into I just got a copy of um, is it Max is it Bazerman yes. Bazerman Bazerman uh, he, yeah, he has a, a book that's coming out next month called uh, something like The Power of Noticing. Uh-huh. And I, I just I just flipped through a couple of pages. I like, I think I just read that book. <laughs> 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 I think I, 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 it'd be interesting to see what, what he brings to the discussion. But uh, 
Uh, that book comes out in August too. So I'm thinking about doing yours, getting that published out, and then maybe Max is like a couple months later, so it's not just back to back the same sort of uh, or similar sorts of ideas. So uh, okay, I, I know I Max, but I didn't know he had a new book coming out, so I'll, I'll, I'll be on the lookout for it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, I think August 5th is the publication date, if I remember. And actually, I had that press release right in front of me, but I must have put it down. But um, it, uh, I think it's called The Power of Noticing, but it, it's a book on paying attention. And uh, just a quick glance to it, I think... Um, uh, I think he owes you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be good. Uh, next time I see yeah, him, I'll, yeah. I'll tell him that. <laughs> yeah, you tell him that. Yeah, yeah. All right, Gary. Well, thank you very much. I hope you have a uh, a good rest of your rotisserie season. Your fantasy uh, baseball is Devora still kicking your butt, or are you beating her this year? Uh, I am beating her. I am in first place right now. Ooh, well, you, you hate to brag, but it's hey, teams. Hey, if it's the truth, it's not bragging. Then, so. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I wish you much continued success, Gary. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Andy. I appreciate the chance. Okay. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, here it is. Thanks. Oh, here it is. <laughs> oh, ho, ho, here it is. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>